How's it going guys? Today I want to go over another leak code question with you guys. Today our question is called partition equals subset sum and it's a question that's being asked by Facebook. Alright guys, so today our question is called partition equals subset sum. It's a question that's being asked by Facebook and our problem description says given a non-empty array containing only positive integers Find if the array can be partitioned into two subsets such that the sum of elements in both subsets is equal. It tells us as a note that each of the element array, each of the array elements will not exceed 100 and the size of the array will not exceed 200. So now if we just walk through two of these examples quickly, if we're given the input of numbers 1, 5, 11, and 5, we would return true. And the reason for that is the array can be actually partitioned into two different subsets one containing 1, 5, and 5, and the other containing just 11, and both of those subsets sum to the same number, which is 11. So now if we take example 2 here, if we had 1, 2, 3, and 5, we would return false, because there's no way we could possibly partition this array so that the two subsets of the array are equal. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense now. We're given a list of numbers. We're asking, can we break up these numbers into two different groups? so that the two sums of both of those respective groups equal each other. All right, so I think that makes sense now. And how are we gonna solve this? Well, we've done similar problems in the past on my channel, and a good way to kind of simulate this is just simulating making all these different subsets, right? So let's just make all these different subsets, and then we need to add them together, right? And basically see if their sums are equal. So. That's a little slow, but that's more or less what we're gonna do, but we're not gonna constantly sum two different subsets. What we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate making those subsets. We're not actually gonna make them. And we're just gonna keep track of what the sum would be if we had whatever subset that was. I know that's a little abstract, but that's basically how we're gonna start solving this. And I wanna go over this problem because it's a dynamic programming problem, okay? And so I'm gonna come up, you know, probably pretty soon I'm gonna release a video on dynamic programming and try and talk about uh, like how to understand it, what it is, why it works, um, because I felt like it was a super hard thing that I didn't really grasp in school, and I wish it was explained in a way that was a lot clearer. So I'm going to do my best to do that in a, a you know a video that's going to follow this, but hopefully that's kind of a precursor to that video, and hopefully going through this problem will help you understand dynamic programming. So this isn't really this first part isn't going to be too complicated. Uh, the first thing that we could do just as a really simple check is if we add all these numbers together and the numbers are not even, then there's no way that we can, you know, split these numbers such that the two different groups have an equal sum, right? So we could very quickly just do that check. So let's add all our numbers together, check if they're even or odd, and if they're odd, we'll just return false right away. So we're going to say in total, because this is going to represent the total that we have for all the numbers, right? And now we're going to say for every number, so for an i in nums, we're just going to say total plus equals i. Now that we have the total, let's just check if it's even. So if total mod 2 is not equal to 0, meaning that if we try and split these numbers in half, basically, right? Uh, if this number is not a multiple 2, can't be even, so it has to be odd. So if it is odd, we're going to return false. Okay. So now this is where we get to the interesting case, right? So if we're at this case, we know we have an even number. And now we need to try simulate, make, simulate, we need to start simulating, making those different subsets and seeing if any of those different subsets can have the same sum. So if you guys have watched my videos before, the kind of ways I like to solve recursive problems like this is basically having a shell function that does a little bit of work, if any work at all. And then we call a magical recursive function that we're gonna write and that will tell us the answer. So here we're just gonna call our recursive function that we're then gonna write. So we're gonna say, okay, if we get to this point, we have to do some work of generating these different subsets. So just return what the answer would be. So return, we're also gonna call this Ken partition. And what we're gonna pass now is a few things. And I wanna explain the sort of like naive approach first and then optimize use dynamic programming. I can't speak today. Optimize using dynamic programming. So the first thing that we wanna do is that naive approach. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna want is basically our numbers, right? We need to know what numbers we can iterate over. We need to know what index that we're at in the numbers. We need to know whatever the sum is of the current subset that we're making. Um, and that's, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, and the total, right? We need to know 
whatever the total is that the, these numbers all add to. So to represent that, we're gonna pass our nums, we're gonna pass the index that we're at in our numbers, we're gonna pass the sum of the current subset, and we're also gonna pass the total of all the numbers of them together. Cool, so now let's start writing this recursive function. So we're gonna say public, it's gonna return a Boolean, right? Telling us the answer as to whether or not we can find those two different subsets that sum to the same value. And we called this Ken partition. We're taking an integer of numbers. We're taking an int index, an int sum. So again, whatever you know, uh, index we're at in our numbers, whatever the current sum is of the current subset, and then we're taking an integer called total. Great. So now let's just check our base case, right? Our recursive function is always gonna have two different things. The first thing we're gonna have is a base case that will tell us when to stop our recursive calls. The second thing is gonna be our recursive calls. That's gonna continue the recursion until we hit our base case. So what is our base case here, right? What are we looking for? Well, we're looking for two different subsets that sum to the same number. So if we're simulating making a subset in this recursive function, if the sum of the recursive Sorry, if the sum of the current subset we have multiplied by two equals our total, that means that whatever subset that we have now, right, in my hand right here that you can see, uh, if the other subset has the same amount, then we're good, right? So if our sum times two equals our total, then that checks out, then we get a return true. So if our sum, right, our current sum times two is equal to our total, total, then we're gonna return true. Great, so now that's our truthy case for our base case. What's our falsy case, right? When do we wanna stop recursing and it's not true? Well, if, you know, we only have positive numbers here, it tells us. So if we get to a point where our sum is greater than, well, what does it have to be greater than? It has to be greater than half of our total, right? So if our sum is greater than our total divided by two, right? That's our first case. Our second case is if we actually walk through all the numbers, we still haven't found what we want, right? So if one, our sum is greater than our total divided by two, or if our index is greater than or equal to nums.length, right? So if, again, you know, we've collected too big of a sum, or we've walked through all the numbers, and we have no numbers left, we're just gonna return false. And otherwise, guys, if we get down to line 23, we need to continue our recursion. Right, so to continue our recursion, we're gonna start that simulation, right? Taking and not taking these different numbers. So it's as simple as just returning can partition, and now let's simulate not taking the current number that we're on. So what we would do is we pass nums, we'd pass our index plus one, right? Because we're gonna to move to the next number. We would pass our sum with nothing added to it, right? Because we're not taking whatever number we're on, and then we would also pass our total. And what we're gonna or that with is the recursive call where we do take the number, which is as simple as saying, can partition our nums index plus one, sum plus nums of index, right? So that's actually how we're simulating taking that number. We're taking the current number, we're adding it to our sum, and then again, our total. And that's it, right? That is how this logic works. If we find what we're looking for, return true. If we've got, you know, gathered too many numbers or sum is too big, or we've walked through all the numbers, return false. And otherwise, just kind of keep recursing, right? Every number, branch out, try and pick two different things, uh, two different paths, right? Take the number, don't take the number. But this is gonna get a time limit exceeded. And so that's bad, we don't want that, so how can we optimize? And this is where dynamic programming comes in, okay? So if you can notice here, we're making two different recursive calls and you can probably guess that some of them probably aren't necessary every single time. And that's where dynamic programming comes in. And if you guys are having trouble uh, understanding what dynamic programming is, the way I like to think about it is it's literally recursion, if you're doing it from a top-down point of view, which we are here. Don't worry about the buzzwords. But recursion is something we only need to do once, right? So whatever sub-problem we have, let's solve it and let's store it. So all dynamic programming does is it makes sure that you're not making any extra recursive calls, and it makes sure that you only solve a single sub-problem one time. So all dynamic programming is, I like to say, is it's literally just recursion, but without any extra recursive calls. That's literally all it is. It's literally you're doing some recursion, 
but you're just remembering the results. And we'll talk, you know, in that later video more about recursion, sorry, about dynamic programming, and if we had done it from a bottom-up approach, but I don't want to get into that now. So all you can think of is dynamic programming is basically uh, recursion, but you're not, you know, doing it any more times than you need to. You're just remembering all the results of your recursive calls. So now let's actually implement that, right? Let's start remembering all the results of our recursive calls. So to do something like that, we're going to introduce something called state. Okay, and so each of our subproblems can be represented by some state. We're going to either, you know, solve that subproblem and then remember it. And if we ever get to a point where we see that subproblem again, we're just going to pull out whatever that result was. So in addition to the total, we're also going to pass a hash map. And this is what's going to represent our state. So our state is going to be represented by a string. A string and then very quickly, we'll know whether or not that state is uh, good or bad, right? So if it can give us what we want or not. Um, and so we're, we're going to map it to a Boolean. And so now all we actually have to do, guys, is add to our truthy case or our falsy case is if we've ever computed this state before, just return whatever it gave us, right? So if our state, sorry, I actually forgot something. We need something to represent our state. Right, so how are we gonna represent our state? Well, the two things that really matter here is the index and the numbers that we're at, as well as the sum that we currently have. So those are the two things. So we can build a state based off of that. So I'm gonna say string current, meaning our current state. And we said those are the two variables that we need. Right, so I'm gonna say our state is really just our index, so some number, and I'm gonna add an empty string just to make it into a string, so that these two numbers don't get actually added together. So it's something like three and five don't give us eight, but it gives us three and five like a string, three and five. Uh, so I'm gonna say index plus an empty string, which is just an easy way to convert things to strings, and then I'm gonna say sum. Okay, so now we have our state, and now we're just gonna check if we've ever computed this state before. We've already done the work, just return whatever we found. So if our state contains our key current, then we're just gonna return whatever that result is, right? So state.get Awesome. So now, same stuff, right? We're just, you know, are figuring out what our state is, and if we've ever done the work to compute that state, just return whatever the result was. So now all that's left to do is actually, in each of these recursive calls, we want to store them, right? We want to store them so we can put them into our state object before we actually return. So that's as easy as just saying something like Boolean, and I'm going to say found partition, right? So if we can ever actually find the partition, that's what this variable will be equal to, true or false. Either we found the partition or we didn't. And again, it's gonna be basically taken from the same stuff, right? So it's as simple as just storing whatever we found. So we're still doing the same work, right? We're still gonna simulate taking and not taking uh, the current number that we're on, except before we return that result, we just wanna put it into our state so that we know at any other recursive call if we have to redo that work or not. Uh, or not, sorry, not redo that work, but if we actually need to do that work at all. So now that we have made these recursive calls, let's store the result in our state. So we'll say state.put, and we're gonna put our current state, right, whatever the index is and the sum added together as a string with whether or not we are actually able to find what we wanted, so found partition. And now after that, guys, now all we actually have to do is return our result. So now quickly, let's just talk about our runtime. Oh wait, and I also need to fix my recursive calls here. I need to add our state. State, and I also need to add it to the function declaration. So now we're taking a hash map as well. And again, it's a string, let's sting a string <laughs> to a Boolean and we call it state. Okay. So now let's talk about a runtime, right? So before our runtime could have been classified as I think two to the n, where two just comes from the fact that every single number we have two different choices, right? If we're at some number, I can either take that number, which is one branch of logic, or I can not take that number, which is another branch. Um, and the n just comes from however many numbers we have. So n is however many numbers we have, two comes from the fact that we have two choices every number, so our runtime is two to the n. Our space complexity I think would be O of n, where again, n is just our amount of numbers, however many numbers we have. And the reason why we're using memory is we have these different recursive calls, right? So our, our recursive calls can go as deep as however many numbers we have. So I think the runtime is O of n. 
Now, with our optimization, uh, the runtime is going to be bounded by however many unique subproblems we have. And what are the subproblems coming from? They're coming from our state. And where does the state come from? It comes from our index and our sum. So what's the biggest that index could be? Well, the index is just where in the numbers we are. So the index could be as big as however many numbers we have. So n, let's say, however many numbers we have. And then m would be, well, how many different ways can we have sum, right? Well, sum is kind of coming from our total, right? The total of all the numbers added together. So I think m would really be our total. So I think our runtime would be n times m, where n is just the number of numbers we have, and m is the total of all those different numbers, because that's how many different combinations we could potentially have. So now we've knocked the runtime down from 2 to the n to n times m, where I just explained those variables. But I think our recursive calls would still be kind of doing us in in terms of memory, where we'd have o of n memory. And again, it's just the recursive calls going as deep as however many numbers we have. So let's run this code. Let's make sure that it works. And it does it because we're returning result for whatever reason. And I called this found partition. So now let's run it and make sure that it works. Awesome, and it does. So guys, that's how to solve partition equals subset sum in Java. Again, it's a question that's being asked by Facebook. If you guys enjoyed this video and found it helpful, do me a favor and leave the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more. And I'll see you guys next time. If I pull up with a Kerry Washington, that's gonna be an enormous scandal. I could have Naomi Campbell, still might want me a Stormy Daniels. Sometimes you get a bag to boss up. I call that ticket Corey Gambles. Find yourself up in the food court. You might have to enjoy your sample. All these stocks.